I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A couple of announcements. Um, First of all, I'd like to congratulate the Winona football, senior high football team yes. on a great season and a job well done, and we're all very, very proud of them. Also, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, start it out with, uh, we have a presentation that's going to take about 10 minutes or no longer than that, um, having to do with invasive uh, species here in Winona County, and before I... Uh, Call on them to come up. I'd like to uh, say a special appreciation and to thank the two dozen uh, plus volunteers who beat back the invasive oriental bittersweet vine over the last two years throughout the Winona area. This group has cleared over 15 acres in the Sugarloaf and Holzinger Trail areas, as well as working with private landowners, and put in nearly 600 hours since 2018. The city would especially like to thank Winona residents Bruce and Lisa Eng, who have been the volunteer coordinators and spearheaded these efforts, as well as the county for securing funding for the tools to do the work. And with that, I'd like to ask the volunteers to come forward and uh, begin their presentation. Yeah, so we're the, we're the interns operating off of Grant from the uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'm Brian. Alex? Mallory. And uh, yeah, we're here to talk about uh, invasive species, specifically the orange bitter sweet that we Could you speak up into the microphone so people can <laughs> yeah, hear you? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, orange bitter sweet is a vine. Um, it, wraps itself, it wraps itself around trees and it um, chokes out the life of the tree and takes over the canopy. And by doing this, it'll bring the trees down and it'll just create areas that are uh, impassable to both uh, humans and wildlife. Um, so here's what can happen if it can take over an area unchecked. Like it first grows up around one tree, and then it spreads out underground and comes back up and needs to branch off. Um, here are what the berries look like uh, in the winter time. Uh, you may have seen these around. They are really bright and colorful, and people like to make wreaths out of them. Um, and that is not the right thing to do because they go to compost them and the berries get spread that way. Um, birds will also go through and eat them. Um, so here are the two types. There's American bittersweet, which is a native. Uh, it grows these terminal cross clusters of berries, um, but the invasive here has berries all up and down the stem. So that's a good way to identify it if you see it. So if you're doing any wreath making, definitely double check. Um, the American bittersweet, the native, is here with the orange capsules and the oriental bittersweet, the invasive, has these yellow capsules. Um, so uh, this is our most severe infestation. It is over 68 years old, and as you can see, it is um, such an invasive vine that it will literally cover entire areas so that you cannot walk through them, meaning you can't hike, you can't hunt for animals or morels. You basically, it just makes areas completely impassable. And it, <coughs> As you can see, there's an incredible amount of berries produced, so it uh, propagates also by birds eating them and then, you know, taking the seed elsewhere. Um, Here's an example of a 68-year-old vine that we that oh. Bruce actually cut himself. Whoa, um, whoa. That, that's, that's a vine. That's a vine. It, these will be wrapped around that's trees, but then they start to look like trees <laughs> themselves, and that's why it's important that we kind of catch up on this thing that's already been creeping for 68 years. Are the seeds the only way it propagates? Uh, that we know. Or yeah, roots? It, it, not, it, it not any roots. It, it, also, it, also, it also has a very complicated root system ah, okay. where um, it will grow in and then it can grow up to 60 feet in any direction. Hmm. Um, cool. So, uh, one problem with Oriental Bittersweet is it cannot be burned or cut. It will only stimulate the plant and grow uh, more aggressively. So we use something called Garland 4 Ultra, which is a hormonal herbicide where we cut the plant at the stem and then just dribble a little bit of the herbicide onto the plant where it then soaks down into the roots and then kills it from there. Um, oh, uh, one other thing, you cannot use Roundup on it. Roundup does not work. <laughs> but that works on anything. <laughs> um, so last year's intern event us, of course, 
um, working on some of these vines. As you can see, that extremely <coughs> knotted mess in there is just another great example of how horrible this stuff can get. Uh, some pictures of Bruce using all of our tools. We have saw, um, hand saws, chainsaws, of course, um, <coughs> pruners, and loggers. And then every single Friday, uh, we've been taking out volunteers for a few hours, like two to three hours, and um, we get, I mean, what's the average? Seven on average. Hmm. So these are some of the maps that we have uh, created. So this is Sugarloaf right here, and the gray area, um, it's a little bit hard to see, is the eradicated area, which we've uh, completely removed the vine, and then uh, increasing intensity from green, yellow, orange, and then red. And this is also um, Camp Winona, where we have also done some eradication and mapping and hiking around the area. The areas that do not have any color simply mean that we have not been there. I just want to clarify that. It <laughs> definitely can be there. It's just that we have not mapped it yet. We found it very important to be mapping now because we do want to see where it is. And that's really important for educating landowners to be great on the map. Yeah. And speaking of education, too, we have at this point decided that that's definitely key. Outreach is important. Getting people involved is the only way we're going to be able to get a hold of this because it's such a vast problem that three interns and a few staff members and some volunteers aren't going to be able to do it on their own, especially when it comes to private landowners that have it on their own property. And we, of course, need to work with them to be able to eradicate that. Uh, and so what we do is we'll meet with these landowners, we'll get a hold of them, the ones that we believe have it on their property, or they'll reach out to us if they believe they have it. And then we'll go out there, train them on the proper ways to eradicate it, work with them side by side for a few hours, and then we also provide them with the proper herbicide to help take care of it so that they can work independently in the future and continue on their own property. And so how this all started, we didn't even become aware that this was a huge problem in Winona until about 2011. And after a lot of lobbying and work in 2018, uh, we were able to get a grant provided by the state to eradicate species that are included on the prohibited eradicate list as oriental bittersweet is. And thanks to our county weed inspector, Ann Morse, uh, she's the one that was able to obtain these grants from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture in 2018 and 2019 in order for us to start working on eradicating this infestation. And so going forward, we now know that the bluff lands in the city of Winona are severely infested and that a lot of the woodland surrounding areas as well in the surrounding townships, Homer, Wilson, Hillsdale, Warren are all also infested. And we're currently pursuing a two-year grant for 2020 and 2021 in order to help eradicate more around the area, working with City of Winona and also Houston County. And the goal for that is to try and finish the eradication, get rid of everything. So what we've accomplished so far, a few numbers that I'll just run over quick. Uh, We've met with over 95 landowners, and this is covering the last two years of our grant. We've mailed information to 969 different households, had six different outreach events, treated over 390 acres of woodlands, surveyed 722 <coughs> acres. Uh, we have, as volunteers, community members, landowners, have dedicated over 786 hours to eradicating themselves. And then for paid staff and interns, have dedicated about 488 hours total to eradicating. And for the volunteers that we've had, 80% of them have worked within the city limits, eradicating themselves. And then our interns over the past have dedicated about 55% of their time to eradicating specifically within the city limits. And then if any of you believe that you have seen Oriental Bittersweet on your property or want to help, want to work with us, know people that might want to work with us, I have up here our email that you can email us at, Anne's phone number, any contact information that you may need. And that is all. Very impressive. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Um, I do have a question for you, though. I'm just I'm curious how widespread this problem is. is it more than southeastern Minnesota, I'm sure. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not just us, and we're part of helping to get others aware of it too. And we're trying to get as many people aware of it too. And that's the big part too, with us starting to work with Houston County and hopefully getting further and further outreach so that more Minnesota can. So where does this leave American bittersweet as opposed to the, I mean, you know, compared to 
people who'd like to use a type of plant like that in decorations or something like that. So American British fruit doesn't grow nearly to that extent. Um, it stays to relatively well, like that thick, mm. um, versus this thing. Yeah, I know, that's, that's um, impressive. It doesn't spread nearly as, as far. This, this particular plant is from Southeast Asia, and so just with the different climates where it survives normally there, it can just, it's such a high fecundity here that it just takes over. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing it spread from the east, eastern states, across. So if we can make a border somewhere along the west, we'd like to be a part of bringing that. Take the stand at the river, right? Yeah. Exactly. No more. <laughs> and uh, in response to the question about other places in the state, actually, um, Monona and the city of Red Wing are really the two hot spots across the state, and that's really it. Um, it's and it's spreading all through there. And our and Monona is, is a lot worse. It's way you know, more expensive. Mm -hmm. I think it's had a longer time to spread. Sixty-eight years is a long time. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for your efforts. Yeah. Mayor? Yeah, George. Yeah, just one question. I don't know if I heard the answer correctly, but now what do you mean that it cannot be burned? If a person's trimming that off your tree, whatever it may be, you put it on a brush pile, uh, you cannot burn that? So if you have the plant um, in an area and you decide to, to burn the area to halt growth and try and uh, eradicate it that way, it actually just stimulates the plant and it sends those nutrients down to the roots where it just grows more aggressively. Mm -hmm. anything, anything you cut, you can burn. Yeah. Um, but if you're just cutting and not spraying, where you cut from will have more growth still. Okay. And then, like with the Roundup thing, we've seen it where homeowners have cut it and sprayed it with Roundup, and we just see a, a green twig growing oh, right next to the Roundup zone. So. Okay. The reason this doesn't work, um, particularly just to answer your question a little bit more in depth, is that the root systems are so uh, deep that it fire does not reach down to the depths of the root and um, even if you cut it and, and you think you yanked it out there's still more that you may not see okay. but you can put it on a pile and burn it as yeah, you cut I mean, it, it can, yes it okay. can really be burned okay. burning it only causes it to grow more okay thank you <clears throat> well thank you very much all right um, Another item under the my time is uh, we have some uh, awards and grantees and uh, some announcements about uh, uh, our creative uh, community and the Teresa Remick from the Fine Arts Commission, who chairs the Fine Arts Commission, is here to uh, make some announcements. Thank you. Good evening, <coughs> Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm Teresa Remick, Chair of the Fine Arts Commission, and I'm very pleased tonight to honor and recognize several creative uh, practitioners and organizations here in the city of Winona um, that we find have been doing incredible work locally and that we look forward to seeing more wonderful work from in the year to come. Um, first, it's my honor to present our first Creative Laureate position to Sarah Johnson. Uh, Sarah has been a Winona resident for nearly 20 years and has been active throughout the community in various creative pursuits, um, both musical and visual arts, as well as through activities with Battle of the Bands, um, with murals that you may have seen through downtown, both at Bluff Country Co-op, um, as well as through a Third Space grant project locally um, just down on Third Street last year. Um, she is also very active through Minnesota Marine Art Museum's Second Saturday programs, facilitating arts activities, um, as well as a series of mindfulness and art workshops that make arts accessible to all of us everyday people, myself included, who are not artists. <laughs> um, uh, I'm really excited, and I hope I speak for the commission to say that we're all honored to have Sarah representing our creative community here, and I really look forward to how she'll be a voice for the creative community in Winona, uh, how she can help advise both the commission and council as we move forward with creative projects in Winona, and also how she will work to make the arts accessible to all in our community. Um, with that, I'd just like to present Sarah Johnson. Um, a little recognition as our first creative laureate. Uh, next up, we have our 2019 Fine Arts Commission Awards. 
Uh, these awards n recognize uh, both businesses and individuals who contribute and support arts and culture throughout the city. Uh, first is Mary Farrell. Mary has been a diehard arts supporter and creative practitioner in Winona for many, many years, um, both as a Fine Arts Commission member who served the maximum number of years she was eligible to serve and had to step down. Um, she has provided support to the community through her work with Visit Winona and prior to that through several other local organizations that support and practice the arts. Um, and you have also seen a lot of her creative work through town in the past several years. Um, her series of photographs of people and a cat was seen at the Winona Public Library last year. And she's had several documentary films seen at the Frozen River Film Festival, which have won People's Choice Awards. Uh, we also look forward to presenting Mary with one of our grants this year, which will be used to help create an original organ score for her newest documentary about the renovation of the Masonic Theater Drops. Um, Mary Farrell, we recognize you as one of our Fine Arts Commission awardees. Next we have uh, Larry and Colleen Wallner. Uh, Larry and Colleen are owners of the Blue Heron Coffee House, which has been a site of much creative activity in our city for many years. Uh, they've supported local artists and organizations through providing space for both artist exhibitions, openings, receptions, as well as our Poet Laureate series for the last several years. Um, in addition to hosting arts events and supporting arts within the coffee house, they've <coughs> also been wonderful supporters to many local organizations through in-kind support and sponsorships. Um, they're generously offering their space for a lovely reception that we'll be using to honor both them as well as the rest of our, our honorees for tonight, um, which we encourage you to attend December 9th at 6 o'clock. Uh, and with that, Larry and Colleen Walner, we present you with a 2019 Fine Arts Commission Award. Uh, our last award for this evening is the Midwest Music Fest. Uh, it was founded in 2010 by Sam Brown uh, during an AmeriCorps project and incorporated as a nonprofit organization in 2014. The festival is now entering its 11th year and offers a mix of activities both in Winona and La Crosse to promote music and art across the region and to provide opportunities for artists to stimulate downtown economic development and to provide educational resources for artist community members and children. Um, and I will say we are just pleased to have Midwest Music Fest as a part of the Winona community and the way that they've been able to activate our downtown scene every spring is a real gift to this community and we're lucky to have them here. Uh, thank you Midwest Music Fest and we have Parker, Parker Corsell here accepting. <laughs> stretch. Um, we are now moving into our new grants for this year. Uh, the Fine Arts Commission is pleased to be presenting grants to four local artists uh, who will use the funds to create works that are about or inspired by Winona and offered to the community and municipal spaces. Um, their projects will be completed over the next year, so we invite you to look forward to more information about seeing and viewing and hearing all of these projects. Uh, first, we have Maria Anholzer. She's a visual artist specializing in art education and fine art as a student at Winona State University. Um, she also is currently the gallery intern at the Watkins Gallery at Winona State University. She recently submitted pieces to the Art Muse competition at Winona State and was accepted into their jury show as well as winning first prize for her work, Lost. Her project for Winona will be to create an original graphic collage drawing that is inspired by shared stories from Winona residents. So she'll be collecting stories from community members and creating an original visual art piece inspired by the stories that she collects. Congratulations, Maria. Mary Farrell, as I mentioned before, is our 
second grantee. Um, she is currently working. She's documented um, the process of restoring the historic drops at the Masonic and was inspired by the organ there. So she'll be working with her documentary team to create an original organ score for that film using this grant project. And that film will premiere at Frozen River Film Festival in 2020. Uh, next we have Patrick O'Shea. He's a tenured professor of music at St. Mary's University where he conducts the concert choir and chamber singers which tours nationally and internationally. Uh, he's also an active composer and has recently established the Valencia Chorale which is one known as newest community choir. Um, just started in September, they already have over 45 members and will be offering their first concert this Thursday at the Chapel of St. Mary of the Angels. Patrick's grant will allow him to create a concert of music next spring um, inspired by Winona and rivers and music that will capture that essence of the Winona River town that we love. Congratulations to Patrick O'Shea. And finally, Sharon Mansour is our last grantee. Uh, Sharon was a 2018 Fine Arts Commission awardee. Uh, she's also a McKnight Fellowship awardee um, and has been seen throughout the Winona community with her project Dreaming Under a Cedar Tree as well as In the Space Between. Um, she will be presenting a series of <coughs> film screenings outdoor through the community of her film Between You and Me which was shot throughout Winona. So we'll have a lovely opportunity to see Sharon's work projected outdoors for the entire community and multiple times throughout the year. Congratulations to Sharon Mansour. And I am reminded we are also pleased um, to share and announce in association with city planning, Carlos, we appreciate so much um, to be announcing the new poetry walk in Winona. Uh, we're currently accepting submissions for anyone in Winona who wishes to submit original poetry that will be stamped into sidewalks throughout town as sidewalk pieces are replaced. Um, there's more information, I believe, on the city website about that for anyone who's interested in submitting. And then one final reminder that we will have this reception to honor this year's awardees, December 9th, 6 o'clock at the Blue Heron Coffee House. And thank you so much for helping me honor everyone this evening. Thank you. Sit on the table. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> That's all? Are you sure? I think the meeting's probably going to be shorter than my my opening. City manager, do you have anything? 
I just want to acknowledge the one year anniversary of the garage opening mm. at Winona's co work space. So, congratulations to them and looking forward to their second year. Good. Thank you. Roll call. Mayor Peterson. Here. Councilman Thurley. Here. Muller. Here. Alexander. Here. Iden. Here. Wojciechowski. Here. Schulmeyer. Here. Under the petitions, requests, and communications, item 3.1 is an application for an on sale intoxicating liquor license for Nosh Scratch Kitchen. And the owners are here if you have questions. Make a motion to approve that request. I second, second that. Motion by Michelle, seconded by Pam. Any discussion? George. Can the owners tell us a little bit as to what they have planned? <laughs> Introduce yourself and. Um. Hi, I'm Greg Jaworski, chef owner. Um, it's just going to be a little 60 seat fine dining dinner only restaurant. So we love to support local community. I like to do everything in house since the scratch kitchen uh, is part of the name. That's what that means. So. From scratch, uh, source locally, humble little restaurant. <laughs> I'm sure everybody wants to know, when are you going to open? <laughs> As do I. Uh, <laughs> we're hoping middle of December. We're kind of at the whim of the contractor, so yeah. it's it's been a slow process, but we'll, yep. we'll get there at okay. the latest January. All right. Well, we certainly look forward to that. Thank you very much. George? Uh, any Polish dishes? <laughs> I, I will pull some out. So, okay. Yeah, okay. No, my, my aunt taught me a, a pretty good pierogi dough. So it's, okay. it's a little tricky, so it won't be on the menu all the time, but the menu does change almost daily. So okay. you'll see them occasionally. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> all right. Thanks. <laughs> Any other discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Item 3.2 the appointment to the Fine Arts Commission of Carrie Frederick. Move to approve that request. Second. Okay. Motion by Michelle, seconded by Paul. Discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Item 3.3, .3, request vacation of the alley on Block 37 of the original plat. This is the site of the former Central School, and this would be to set the public hearing for Monday, December 2nd. So move to set the public hearing for December 2nd. Second. Second. Motion by Michelle, seconded by, I think, George, or is that a yeah. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Item 3.4 is a request for one-way alley for the alley between Washington and Johnson. Make a motion to approve the attached ordinance. Second. Second. Motion by Michelle and seconded by Eileen. Any discussion? Pam. Yes, I just have a question about this. Um, it says there have been issues with several cars meeting larger trucks and not there not being sufficient room to navigate. So I just wondered how would a one-way solve that? Currently, if, if a delivery truck, a mail truck, is going down the alley, it's just too tight for uh, another car to come through the other di different direction. So they now just all go the same direction. And then it's wide enough for one vehicle, as opposed to two oncoming vehicles. It's not wide enough. It is, but it's okay. scary. Okay, it's still going to be tight, though. It's still an alley. It's still an alley. Yep. Right. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Item 3.5 is a request for parking changes near the main square development. Make a motion to approve the attached ordinance. Second. Motion by Michelle and seconded by George. I guess I have a question about this um, parking in that area. is definitely at a premium. And, um, Right now, uh, the Montessori, I think, has drop-off on 4th Street, and then it would move, I'm assuming, over to Johnson Street. And can that be uh, by certain hours, or does it have to be 24 hours? I mean, if that, after 5 o'clock or whatever it is, 6 o'clock, could that parking then be used by the public? Council, that's, that's not what presented here, but I don't know why not. It couldn't happen. It, during school hours, obviously, it has to be dropped off and picked right. up, which would be pretty early in the morning until when school gets out, 3, 3, 4. We certainly could look into that as far as those kind of hours. I don't have a definite 
Well, I don't know if it's a couple of parking spaces, but they all count. It is, it is like two or three. Okay. Uh, I, have, I have a question as well. Uh, it, it says here that on the south side between Main Street and Johnson, no parking because of sight distance issues of vehicles exiting the main square parking lot. Uh, so that means that whole side of the street, there's no parking. Correct. It also has to do with the turning lane getting on to, to Main Street. I mean, it is a highway and mm -hmm. sight distance and, and all of that. So it's a safety concern. And this is recommended by the by MnDOT. MnDOT. By MnDOT, yes. Yeah. It's a requirement. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not even recommended. We, we went round and round with them. Okay. It's a truck it, route, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a bare highway. It's, it's bare for trucks to go around there now. Yeah. This is all to make it safer. Okay. But there's parking there now. Correct. <clears throat> right. Well, well, I know, but still, I agree. It seems excessive. We've we've worked hard to pull back the parking from uh, the corners on Main Street for sight distance issues, and I understand that. But to clear the whole street for that seems really strange. I believe it was part of the condition that MnDOT had for the building. Mm -hmm. That's correct, in the turning lane and all of that. I remember hearing that as well. Um, I, I don't particularly have an issue with that because I think we don't really have a choice, but I know there's a, a lot of evening things in that area from the Historical Society, I think the Masonic, and the, the Laird Norton Center for the Arts, all that. I think if we could add a couple of evening parking spaces there, that would be helpful. We certainly can reach out to the school and see if they have any concerns with that. I don't know if they have evening activities or not, but... Okay. It's meant for drop-off and pick-up. Well, I, I would uh, imagine that uh, for evening activities, that they'll be looking for a place to park as well. Um, uh, I, I would second uh, the mayor's uh, comments and, and anything we can do to get those spots back in the evening would be very helpful. If they're agreeable to it, we'll bring it back as an amendment or a change. Okay. George? Uh, couldn't you just put a time on there, you know, no parking, 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., whatever, whatever their hours are? We could, but I want to be sure to bounce it off the school first okay, to make, make sure they're sure. okay with that. Okay. I think we also need to talk to the police chief about enforcement. Yes. Putting, putting all these different times and changes is, it's not as easy to enforce because of that. Okay. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Item 3 points, no, excuse me, under new business, item 5.1 is the 2020 Minnesota City Participation Program. Well, I'd make a motion for the mayor and city clerk to execute the attached program application commitment agreement. I'll second. second. Okay, we have a motion by Michelle, seconded by Al. Any discussion? George? Lucy, just want to touch on this briefly, and I guess, why would we not approve this? <laughs> yes, Mayor and Council, uh, this is a great program. In a, we support the marketing of the program. It's actually an allocation that goes to the banks, and it's for mortgages for first-time home buyers. And as you can, can see in the uh, chart here, uh, we've ex exceeded our allocated amount each year, so it is widely used, and it's a great program uh, for first-time home buyers. Mm. Yeah. See, you mentioned in your uh, cover about how they get the word out. You're working with Three Rivers, Community Action as well. Are there other methods that your department uses to tell homeowners about this program, prospective homeowners? Well, our main marketing is to the mortgage lenders who okay. generally, you know, meet with the people who are looking to buy a home. So that's the main focus of our marketing, but we'll also put it on our web page. I was going to say, where else could they look for the information? Yes. So a web page is a good, good place for that. Thank you. Paul? So just looking at the allocated amount uh, as compared to the committed loan amounts, it's, we have literally five times as many requests, dollar requests, as we had to allocate. Correct. So th that tells us that uh, this is something maybe the state could, you know, pick up a little bit more slack on. 
exactly. We have a, a pretty good history of utilizing the program, mm -hmm. uh, so we're hopeful that in future years our allocation can go up. What does happen is if there's communities that don't use their allocation, it goes back to the state and can be redistributed, mm -hmm. um, and that's how Winona's gotten more commitments. Is there a formula for the alloc allocation? I believe they have a formula, and uh, I'm not quite sure what it is. But okay. It's um, complex. I'm sure it is. Okay. George? Yeah, this, this program has been very successful within the third ward and fourth ward over the years, so there's been some uh, benefiting properties that it really helped out. So Yes. Anything else? If you vote, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Item 5.2 is a contract amendment for the evening dial -a ride service through Three Rivers Community Action. Make a motion to approve the amendment to the agreement with Three Rivers and authorize the mayor and city clerk to sign the agreement. Second. Motion by Michelle and seconded by Eileen. Discussion? Michelle. Monica, I don't know how you did it. But I think for years we've sat here and asked for longer hours for people who work different shifts so they have an option to get to and maybe not from work so easily, but at least to their job. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really happy to see this and I hope that the community takes advantage of it so we can keep it. It's great. I'm very pleased. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Passes. Item 5.3 is the plat review for the Brenner subdivision. I'd make a motion to um, approve the attachments A and B and accept C, uh, approving the Brenner subdivision plat review documents. I'll second that. Motion is by Michelle, second by George. Discussion? Eileen? I have a question. Just a question. Um, uh, just the deadlines that are listed here. Um, so what, what happens if those are missed? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, to answer that question, uh, the deadlines are in the development agreement. If the deadlines are missed in the uh, development agreement, essentially we would begin uh, a set of remedial actions <coughs> that are also in the agreement as well. One of those remedial actions could be reverting the zoning of the property back mm -hmm. to its original R3, uh, I'm sorry, R2 classification. Okay. Paul? And that's for any breach of the contract? Yes, uh, in accordance with the contract, um, there's a list of remedies, uh, and that is one of the actions that we okay. may take. Um, so <clears throat> I, I hope that, uh, that the deadlines are not missed. Um, if, if they are missed and then those remedial actions are taken, do we, you know, we've had conversations about demolition by neglect before. I mean, is there anything... Um, if the if the building sits empty and isn't uh, updated or attended to at all, if the dates aren't adhered to, if they're not met, I imagine we'd be back in front of council at a future date with an update. Okay. Anything else? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. <coughs> Curious. And item 5.4 is a letter of support for the county's noxious weed and invasive plant grant. I make a motion approve. to assign the attached letter of support. Second. Motion by Michelle and seconded by Paul. Any discussion? Michelle? Well, I don't see how when they're asking so little of us and they've given so much we could say no. Hmm. Hmm. Paul? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, John. Uh, and all the volunteers for their work. Uh, I know and I'm looking forward to an opportunity to go out as a volunteer with the crew. I haven't had a chance yet. Um, I can tell you that there is plenty of oriental bittersweet that we've missed, uh, maybe in the Sugarloaf area. So I'll have to go back and check uh, and uh, hope that I get a chance. But I just want to thank the county uh, for writing the grant. Thank John for coordinating and helping with the volunteers and, and kind of putting our city out there to take care of this. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Item 7.1 is council concerns. We'll start with Pam. 
happy. Not a surprise. I want. I really would like to welcome you all to the city's Thanksgiving dinner, citywide Thanksgiving dinner, next Tuesday on the 26th of of November at starting at about 4.30 p.m. at the East End Rec. This has been a wonderful time for the last couple of years that I've been there and it's a very welcoming and warm-hearted event. I hope you can all come. That's the hours again? 4.30, 4 .30 p.m. and probably until the turkey's, okay. turkey's done. <laughs> until the turkey's right. gone. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Sorry, I don't know whether it's perfect. We are still looking for sponsors for that event. Uh -huh. Sp like Sponsors would also be welcome, and please call the Park Rec Department for that. Paul? Okay. Uh, I want to, uh, in a similar vein, uh, thank the cyclists who pedal for the people on Saturday, along uh, with uh, Wellington's Pub. Uh, they combined, they raised over $200 for community Thanksgiving dinner prepared by New Beginnings Church, and held uh, that'll be held at Wesley United Methodist Church. I don't know the date, I'm sorry. Um, but it was a successful event. We had uh, 15 riders, and um, uh, I really appreciate the support that Wellington's gave on Saturday. Also, um, I'm sorry to hear about the passing of House Representative Diane Loeffler from Minneapolis, who I had the privilege to dine and chat with during our October, October mini session. Um, it was really enlightening and encouraging to chat with her. Her dedication to her work continued even during her illness, and this leadership was very evident here in Winona. Well, sorry to hear that. Our, my condolences to her family. Okay, thank you, George. Okay, thank you. I just want to acknowledge uh, two passings. First of all, condolences to the family of Sylvester Mullen. Uh, Sylvester Mullen died at a young age of 99, and he served our country very proudly in the U.S. Army Air Corps, and his celebration of life was held on Veterans Day, a more, it really was a fitting day for Sylvester. So to his, his children, his grandchildren, uh, condolences as, as we uh, move on without this man. And also condolences to the family of Paul Kinsel. Uh, Paul, who we mainly know from Betty Jo Bialuskis, he was owner of that for, for many years, and condolences to his children, his sisters and brothers, and wish that family well, too, as the holiday season approaches. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Michelle? I really just want to say happy Thanksgiving, and may your deep day be full of turkey, stuffing, family, friends, and football. That's all I have. Okay. Eileen? Nothing from me. Yeah. Uh, I had a constituent request. Um, I mentioned last meeting about the dog park and the need for shelter. I was told after the meeting that uh, the city received some uh, funding from a donor to allow that to happen, in fact, to build two shelters at our dog park. And when I was talking to the constituent about that, uh, they suggested perhaps that and maybe staff is already looking into this, that we begin a process to create some sort of watering facility for, uh, for the uh, participants in the dog park. I, I think uh, they mentioned a sand point, and I don't know if that's quite appropriate for that area, but you know, I'm just passing it along for staff to look at and maybe come back with some There's ideas. There's no water out there now? I thought there was a hose. I don't think, there was no. I don't no, think so. Really? That's uh, bad. No. Um, and then, again, with everybody else, a very happy Thanksgiving. Okay, thank you. And under the consent agenda, there are three items. Approval of the minutes from November 4th and November 13th. A claim against the city by Whitewater Properties and a claim against the city by Rebecca Reiners. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Al, seconded by Michelle. Any discussion? Very none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Here. Mayor, I move we adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Carried. Adjourn.